Good evening. You'll be finding in your Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 25, which will be for our time together this evening. Open up our Bibles and be one to, with together in Deuteronomy chapter 25. I don't know if you follow other churches on Facebook or YouTube or things like that. I've seen a Total Eclipse of the Heart for a sermon titled today. I've seen The Day the World Went Dark. Uh, I know a couple people are talking about uh, end time related things for some reason. I, I think there's a reason for it. I don't know. Maybe you check about tomorrow at 1 30 in the afternoon, see if you can hear anything about that. We're going to continue thinking about Deuteronomy this evening, Deuteronomy chapter 25 tonight. As we're opening up in Deuteronomy chapter 25 and continuing looking at these various laws that are written for the people of Israel and helping them to understand the relationship with God, just a quick reminder of the big idea of Deuteronomy and what it meant for the people of Israel and, I think, the big purpose that we can take for our lives as well. Thinking about, as recipients of God's grace, how do we effectively live in a covenant relationship with God? They have been shown God's grace in multiple ways. We have been shown God's grace in multiple ways. So how do we respond to God's grace? If we are to enter into a covenant relationship with Him as He calls us to, their covenant through the law of Moses, our covenant through the law of Christ, how do we do that? This law very specifically applies to them, and hopefully from time to time we're noticing the principles that we can take and apply to our lives as well. But to sum it up into two words, how we respond to the grace of God by living in a covenant relationship with Him is that we love the Lord and that we listen to the Lord. As we love the Lord, we're devoted to Him and thinking about all the things He wants us to be. And along with that, we listen to Him. And as we listen to Him, it's not just, hey, I hear what you're saying and acknowledging it. But just like we heard from Jesus in Matthew 7 this morning, those who listen and do or apply the things that I'm asking you to are those who will be followers of Jesus who live in that covenant relationship with God. So we're seeing more of this idea tonight. We continue in Deuteronomy chapter 25. Notice with me uh, these laws that will cover a couple different sections, things related to marriage, things related to future children, related to honesty and uh, how we treat one another in buying or selling goods, things related to punishment and how that punishment will be brought out. So let's just get together into the text tonight. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 1 through verse 4 to begin. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 1 through verse 4. If there is a dispute between men and they come into the court, and the judges decide between them, acquitting the innocent and condemning the guilty. Then if the guilty man deserves to be beaten, the judge shall cause him to lie down and be beaten in presence with a number of stripes in proportion to his offense. Forty stripes may be given him, but no more, lest if one should go on to beat him with more stripes than those, your brother be degraded in your sight. You shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out the grain." That fourth verse there uh, could be some things we could think about and how we treat uh, the rest of God's creation, specifically related to animals, as they would use these oxen to help uh, do the work they would in their lives of agriculture, that they would not suppress these animals but allow them to enjoy the fruits of their labor. Uh, whether Moses is bringing that thought up here, probably some underlying tones is that Paul definitely brings up the idea about people being worthy of the work that they do when he quotes this in places like 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 18 relating to the work of preachers as well as the work of elders in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 18. The three verses before that speaking related to punishment and how there's a dispute between men and it comes to the court and the court and the judges decide this person is innocent and this person is guilty. And you notice that in verse 2, that the guilty man deserves to be beaten, that if he should be, the judge causes him to lie down and is, being, is going to be beaten in his presence with a certain number of stripes. The idea, of most likely probably with a rod of some kind, taking that and whatever would be proportionate to the crime that's been done, but with a limit to think that this would not bring to some type of excessive retribution as we've seen from time to time. Even within the law, we get the familiar law to other ancient Near Eastern cultures of, you know, if, if you lose an eye, then there would be an eye for an eye, or a hand for a hand, or a foot for a foot. Not necessarily all cultures adopt that, but you see something that would be in proportion to punishment that would be due. And even Paul specifically calling this out in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, about the five times he's received the 39 lashes. It seems obviously, or it seemed very likely by the days of the New Testament, the Jews would just kind of keep it at 39 to make sure they didn't break the law, but 
I don't know what Paul would have done to deserve 39 lashes five times with just preaching the gospel. It seemed they may have taken that and missed the heart of the law there. The heart of the law is really brought up there in verse 3, that the 40 stripes would be given to the man who's beaten in the presence of the judge, the judge overseeing what happens and take place, but no more, lest one should go on to beat him with more stripes than these. And who is the person that's being beat here. It's the person who is the guilty party. It's the person who is guilty of this crime, but he's still called your brother, that he would not be degraded in your sight. Still recognize he is part of the community. He has done something deserving a punishment here, yes, but he is still part of the community. We would not want to bring extra shame, bring upon the fact that he deserves this discipline, bring upon a warning to others that they should not also behave in this way, but recognize how we would treat one another in a humane way kind of way. And it would show respect for the dignity of your brother. Let's move on to verse 5 through verse 12. Deuteronomy chapter, uh, chapter 25, verse 5 through verse 12. If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife, perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. The first son whom, shall bear, whom she shall bear shall succeed in the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out in Israel. The man does not wish to take his brother's wife, and then the brother's wife shall go up to the gate and the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists, saying, I do not wish to take her, then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, pull off his sandal from his foot, and spit in his face. And she shall answer and say, So shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And the name of his house shall be called in Israel, the house of him who had his sandal pulled off. When men fight with one another, and the wife of the one draws near to rescue her husband from the hand of him who is beating him, and puts out her hand and seizes him by the private parts, then you shall cut off her hand. Your eye shall have no pity. We focus on these first six verses in verse 5 through verse 10. And maybe you have the heading there of a laws concerning the Leverite marriage. This Latin term that we sometimes use in our headings here of the brother-in-law law. Uh, that thought of being just, as it's stated there in verse 5, if you have brothers who dwell together, it seems that these are brothers who are in the same household, even though one of them is obviously married and one of the brothers dies, that the wife of the dead man uh, would have the opportunity to have the dead husband's brother marry her and to bring children that would perpetuate her husband's name. That sounds probably very strange to us. I don't know anybody who's impacted Leverite marriage in the past 32 years in my lifetime, or really anybody else in my social, maybe outside of my social circle, outside of the world, maybe that still happens. But really, in the ancient Near East, this is not that uncommon of a practice. And again, particularly for God's people, the point here being that the, uh, the land and the inheritance that would go into a family would stay with that family. That's a big part of the promises that God has made, is that they would have the land, they would have the inheritance, and that would go to the families that God has given them to. And so here is an opportunity for someone to do a social obligation, a moral obligation, to try to help his dead brother's wife by taking care of her, by bringing children that will help to inherit his brother's uh, possessions and all of the inheritance that would come after him. But the law doesn't force that onto people. As it says in verse 7, the man may not wish to take his brother's wife. There are some people who will speculate about that. They'll write and they say, well, maybe he's kind of greedy and wants the inheritance for himself. So he's kind of doing it out of a selfish way. Maybe, obviously, if he's already married, then they wouldn't even be qualified for that. Maybe he just doesn't want to take on the woman and to be a provider for her uh, by taking on this responsibility. We're maybe familiar with this that happens similarly, not with a brother, but in Ruth chapter 3 and 4. And Boaz looking to be the provider for Ruth after her husband had passed. We read and we see how Boaz is commended for his nobleness, for his righteousness. But this man would then be shamed, removing his sandal and the woman spitting in his face, and even just kind of carrying that name, that he may have children of his own and may have his own family later on, but be reminded that he was from the house of him who had his sandal pulled off, who failed to perform that duty of taking care of his sister-in-law and bringing up children for his dead brother. It's something that's talked about just briefly here as an opportunity to help with the inheritance of that person, 
but as well as noticing a good moral opportunity for someone to take care of their family. Verse 11 and verse 12 then come right after that, seem maybe kind of strange. Uh, Maybe you have the headings again that might say something like miscellaneous laws here. Maybe there's a bit of a connection to what the previous section talks about of uh, errors being brought into the world or maybe not brought into the world if the brother-in-law refuses to take on his sister-in-law. You have uh, two men who are fighting and the wife of one of them seizing the private parts of a man. And as that's talked about, as they're trying to break up this fight, this is probably not really a, it was an accident as trying to break it. It sounds like it's probably an intentional thing, looking to harm or hurt that person. And as you think about that and the danger of that and the problem of that, it also relates to the ability for that man to have children or not. That's why you see the very severe punishment in verse 12, that you shall cut off her hand. All the other things are related to, you know, if you lose an eye, then, uh, or if that person loses an eye and it's your fault, you lose an eye. If they lose a foot, you lose a foot. If you kill their ox, you lose an ox. Here, if she does something like this that could affect the future of his family, or maybe not even having a family, there's this serious charge, a serious discipline that's brought against her and her hand being cut off. I imagine with most of these laws, as we've seen from time to time, when a judgment is given or the punishment is talked about, it's meant to be a warning. I don't know how often this is happening, and I would imagine, so I'll, I'll say this is stepping away from the pulpit, Jeff for rear speculation, probably not like an everyday occurrence where women are going around and grabbing the private parts of assaultants who are grabbing and attacking their husbands, but if it was, then hopefully they would notice a lot less arms happening among the women in Israel and recognize the danger of that and see the problem of that as it's brought up here in the law. Let's go to the next couple of verses, verse 13 through verse 16. You shall not have a bag of two kinds of weights, a large and a small. You shall not have a bag in your house or have in your house two kinds of measures, a large and a small. A full and fair weight you shall have, and a full and fair measure you shall have, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. For all who do such things shall act dishonestly and are abomination to the Lord your God. This idea is talked about in other places in the law. You could look at Leviticus chapter 19, verse 35 and verse 36, and even some other dealings with honesty that are talked about in the book of Deuteronomy to see the importance of honesty and character and uprightness, particularly brought up here when it comes to whether you buy things or as you sell things and trying to cheat someone in that regard. That dishonesty is very strongly condemned here among God's people. As it says in verse 15, in the positive way, you would use a full and fair weight And you shall have a full and fair measure that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. From the positive perspective, God is giving you this land. And as you continue to live as righteous and honest and just people, God continues to bless you in this time in this land. But what's the problem with dishonesty? I mean, doesn't that sometimes, can that almost end up becoming like one of the lesser issues? You know, a little bit of cheating here, you know, I, I, I scummed a little bit off the top here. I, I just told a little bit of a lie. Maybe I got a little bit of an advantage, and I'll take that for myself. And maybe next time I'll try to make it up, or another time I'll try to pay it back in some way. Verse 16 says, All who do such things, all who act dishonestly, are an abomination to the Lord. That's some strong language. As God talks about people who are dishonest and behave in that way. Dishonesty is not such some little thing. In fact, you see the positive aspect of this in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 11. Let's get a couple of other passages outside of Deuteronomy for just a moment. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 11. Let me get some Proverbs and then some prophets uh, outside of our Deuteronomy study. Proverbs 16 and verse 11. Part of living according to the fear of the Lord and living according to wisdom that comes from God and His Word, Proverbs 16.11 says that a just balance and scales are the Lord's, and all the weights in the bag are His Word. That the Lord is fair and just in the way that He deals with people, that we need to be fair and just in the ways we deal with people as well. Even as the prophets talk about people, and as uh, God's judgments are discussed amongst God's people, in the book of Amos, chapter 8, find if you would Amos, chapter 8, verse 4 through verse 8. Part of what the the prophets call out for God's people is the fact that they're not doing this very thing that the law talks about here in Deuteronomy. This honesty when it comes to using the weights and the measures to be fair and selling and exchanging of goods. In Amos, chapter 8, verse 4 through verse 8. Hear this, 
you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale? that We may make an ephah small and the shekel great and deal deceitfully with false balances that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. You can see just the dishonesty as the Amos is prescribing the hearts of the people here. The hearts of the people is something uh, very selfish and prideful. Man, when is the Sabbath going to get over so I can start making some money again? Come on, let's go. That's not how God wants his people to behave. They need to respect the Sabbath, honor the Sabbath, as it thinks about the relationship they have with him. And they seem to not really care about that. This is the Lord's judgment that's talked about in this section here. Amos chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, Surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account, and everyone mourn who dwells in it, and all that rise like the Nile, and be tossed about, and sink again like the Nile of Egypt? Honesty, integrity, righteousness are ideas that come up over and over and over again in the book of Deuteronomy, whether explicitly or even just underlying the theme. Honesty, integrity, righteousness that come up even the way we deal with our families. Honesty and integrity and righteousness in the way that we would treat others who are going through times of punishment for what they have done. Those are the type of characteristics that people need to have because that's the type of characteristic that God shows as well. We end Deuteronomy chapter 25 tonight, verse 17 through verse 19. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17 through verse 19. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt. How he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off from your tail and cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind you, and he did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you, in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. Here, this goes all the way back to something that happened in Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17, verse 8 through verse 16, you can read about how people are leaving Egypt after they've crossed the Red Sea. Amalek attacks the people. And even as it's talked about here in verse 16, they attacked you when you were faint and weary, cut off those who were lagging behind you. You get maybe those from the group who, even though they are leaving Egypt with spoils and riches, maybe it's not everyone's picking up at the same fast pace and speed. Maybe there are some who are sick, some who are lame, some who are just making it along, and those in the back are being attacked by Amalek here. God says, I see what they did. I see the fact that they did not fear me or respect me. And so because of that, just like the rest of the nations that I'm talking to you about, particularly in Deuteronomy 7 and Deuteronomy 20, they're going to be destroyed too. And we see that being talked about. We see the problem of Amalek in the days of the judges. We see in 1 Samuel chapter 15 when Saul is king, how God tells him to wipe out the Amalekites. And we see when Saul doesn't do that. And how they're kind of still around even in the days of David. And David does a lot of the work, but even in the days of Hezekiah, 1 Chronicles 4 verse 41 through 43 tells us that Amalek is still around. It seems to finally be quelched around that time. That people finally do what God says in wiping out these people because of their sin and because of their wickedness and how they treated God's people. I appreciate this point, this observation that one writer made, that Moses is hereby in effect declaring, woe to any who interfere with the plan of God. This isn't just God picking a random group of people. It's not like he spun his his roulette board or had a map of the world and took a dart and threw it there and said, all right, uh, Amalek, all right, you're going down. God is noticing and making the point, people who try to interfere with my plans will not get away with those types of things. But I will make sure that my plans are fulfilled and people who stand in the way of me and continue to try to fight against me, what I'm trying to accomplish, will face punishment. I think about in Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, if you would go here, the days of the New Testament, in the early days of the church, when Gamaliel talks to the Pharisees. In Acts chapter 5, verse 38 and verse 39... Gamaliel, as he's talking about what we should do with the apostles and this message they're preaching about Jesus, what do we accomplish or what do we do about all this and trying to maybe quell it a little bit? Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 38. In the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. And so they took his advice. 
Now, obviously, the Jews still had a lot of tensions with Christians early on because they preached about Jesus, and there was still persecution from the Jews later on. But you can see some of that idea here, that if this was just Moses and the Jews saying, hey, everybody, let's just rally up and let's just do a whole bunch of magic tricks to Egypt, and then we'll run out of town with all of their goods and all of their gold, that'd be one thing, and they'll probably die on the wilderness on their own way. But this is God who brought those mighty acts of judgment against Egypt. This is God who is rescuing his people from slavery and bringing them out to have a relationship with him. This is God who's giving the blessings to the people here. And people who stand in the way of God's plans will find themselves on the end of God's judgment. As we look at this text tonight, or as we have looked at this text tonight, it kind of almost seems like we jump all over the place. We try to regularly start with that theme or that idea of Deuteronomy is Moses preaching to people, helping to encourage this next generation of Jews who are going to enter the promised land, how they respond to God's grace and live in that covenant relationship by listening to him and by loving him. A couple of quotes that we find related to this particular section. Deuteronomy chapter 25 seems to kind of be an ending point of a break or close to an ending point. Daniel Block in his commentary on Deuteronomy says, From Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 2 through chapter 25 verse 16, Moses is appealing to this people to demonstrate the wholehearted loyalty to Yahweh that he called for in chapters 6 through 11 by sculptuous adherence to the terms of the covenant spelled out previously. As Block kind of breaks up or helps people to think about the book of Deuteronomy outlining it, he says that Deuteronomy chapter 6 through 11 is described as proclaiming the privilege of the covenant relationship that we have with God. And Deuteronomy 12 through 25 is proclaiming the dimensions of the covenant relationship. And if you were to go back and try to find some of the lessons we've done over the past year, or the past few months, or the past few Sunday nights about Deuteronomy, particularly chapter 12 through 25, it does seem like it's a lot of stuff. In fact, one writer, uh, A.G. Fernando, brings out this point, that this section brings us almost to the end of an outlining detailed laws from chapters 12 through 26. That gives us an idea of what kind of behavior was expected in the new nation of Israel. One more set of instructions remains to be given about first fruits and tithes, but we've seen laws about, if we think of and go back through chapter 12 through 25, acceptable and unacceptable worship, about festivals, about diet, about giving to God and to the needy, about protecting the vulnerable, about leadership and legal practices, warfare and trade, marriage, sex and divorce, animals and plants, combating wrong influencing from neighboring nations, even things related to health and hygiene. That's a lot within those sections from chapter 12 through chapter 25. What a comprehensive list it is, he says. It goes to show that God is interested in all of life and that we are to follow him in everything we do and reflect both his love and his holiness. The result will be a happy society where people live in harmony and are, the needy are cared for. That's true very specifically of the book of Deuteronomy and the covenant that the people had with God with this covenant. And the, even the blessings and curses we'll read about in the days to come, with, like in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and Deuteronomy chapter 28. But I hope that we get the idea that as we study books like Deuteronomy, as we study a lot of these, almost maybe sometimes we might think to ourselves random laws. Sometimes they're described by some of our editors as miscellaneous laws for headings in our Bible. What do we do with all of this? Hopefully we see that comprehensiveness about how God's rule and sovereignty, that his righteousness and his holiness that he shows and exemplifies to us is how we need to behave and be thinking all the time. That as you've been a recipient of God's grace and you're a recipient of God's grace and I'm a recipient of God's grace, that I look to live in a covenant relationship with him. And what does that mean I need to do? I'm not saying we need to go and strictly hold to Deuteronomy. The point with that is that Jesus has come and has fulfilled all of that, and that there is a new covenant that we follow. But we need to recognize then how that covenant relates to all of our life as well. And that covenant has the same idea, that we would love the Lord and that we would listen to Him too. So as we continue through Deuteronomy, and as we'll close within just the next few weeks with the rest of this book, keeping those thoughts in mind, Thinking about some of the things we read about tonight, and again, maybe not that we're going to go out and see Leverite marriages practiced all the time here at Judson Road. Hopefully we're not seeing brothers die and other brothers having to step in in places like that. But hopefully we'll recognize and seeing how God's laws affect every area and relationship of our life. As a father, 
as a husband, how can I be someone who's living in accordance to God's grace and being someone who shows that I love God and then I listen to Him? As a worker, as a teacher, as a, a leader in my uh, business, how can I be somebody who shows that I love God and that I listen to Him? As a preacher, a teacher of God's Word, how can I show in my character, in my teaching, in my words that I love God and that I listen to Him? These are the ideas that Deuteronomy just pounds into us over and over again because they're such important ideas for how we have relationship with the Lord. And that's where we want to close tonight and turn to our invitation. Recognizing that if we're going to have relationship with God, it means we need to respond to what He has done to extend out His hand. That He has shown us His grace ultimately by sending His Son to this earth that we would have the opportunity to have our sins forgiven. But we need to choose to love God and to listen to Him. To put that in another language, that means we need to put our faith in Jesus, that his will and his sovereignty and his ways as king is better than anything I would try to come up or do in my life. That means that all the immorality and sin that's taking place, that to be holy and righteous, I need to follow Jesus' plans and repent of that sin and leave that behind. That I need to recognize that Jesus is Lord, that I hear him and love him and listen to him, and I confess him as my Lord through my words and through my actions every day. And I would start that relationship by being a part of this family, not because of my physical heritage, because of my spiritual heritage, as I'm born again through the waters of baptism, having those sins washed away. If you need to do that tonight to follow Jesus, this is a perfect opportunity for you to do so. Or if you've wandered away from the Lord and you have made a commitment to Christ, but you have left him, you have stopped loving God, stopped listening to him. This evening is a chance for you as well to commit yourself to the Lord once again, to repent of that sin, and that we can encourage you or pray with you and help you in some way we would love to do so. If there's something we can do tonight to help you to come back to the Lord, please come meet me at the front while we stand and while we sing.